Hello, everyone. I'm Christian Roberts. I'm here with my fabulous friend and co-host, Quodicia Johnson. And we are back with another episode of Taking the Stage with Christian. And Quo. And of course, as we begin all of our episodes, we will start this episode with a land and people acknowledgement. We want to take the time right here, right now in this space to acknowledge that we in Dallas are on stolen land. We are on the land of the Caddo, the Wichita, and the Comanche sovereign nations. Nations of human beings who live the full human experience, who love, lost, who fought, who cultivated the land since time immemorial. Nations of human beings who also face horrible conditions, including genocide and policy that allow for forceful removal by any means necessary. We also want to take the time to acknowledge that people were stolen from their homes off the coast of Africa and brought here to this nation, brought here to this land of Dallas and forced into free and enslaved labor. From that free and enslaved labor, we now enjoy what we call Dallas. Dallas is not alone in this as the entire nation benefits from stolen land, stolen labor, stolen people, and stolen lives. We do this not to place blame. None of us created these conditions. They are inherited, just as my last name is Johnson, inherited not from my ancestors, but because I'm a descendant of enslaved people. We do this to speak truth because truth is important in how we connect. Truth is important in understanding how we got to where we are. Truth is important in understanding where we are going. Truth is important in how we reduce the harm and how we heal and create better communities and better connections going forward. So we thank you for this land and people acknowledgement. And we thank you for joining us yet again. Uh, today, we have some very special guests. We're very delighted to have them back. <laughs> Everybody give a warm welcome to Elder Peggy Larney and her son, Brian Larney. Um, we are absolutely delighted to have you all with us Again, uh, as usual, our conversations are always stimulating. We get down to the nit and the grit. Uh, and so it's very good to see you all again. Um, Quo, uh, go ahead and lead us in. Uh, you do introductions so well. So I want to turn this over to you. So you introduce them better than I did. I don't know. Um, I can't <laughs> because here are two amazing individuals who are doing and continue to do and have done such, I don't want to say monumental work because that word does not do it justice, but meaningful work in truth telling and education in bringing communities and organizations together to center truth through art, through uh, cultural heritage, through the stories that we tell the stories we learn and the truth that must be present in all of it. So that does not do them justice, but <laughs> welcome, <laughs> Elder Peggy. Welcome back. Welcome back, Brian. Um, how are y'all? We're doing great. Alito to y'all. <laughs> Beautiful. I'm Peggy Lauren, and I'm a full blood American Indian, and I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation and a descendant of the Mississippi Choctaws. And so today I've been in Dallas area, I guess, over 50 years and one of the few left uh, that knows the history, the beginning of the Dallas history of the American Indians. And so right now my latest progress, and I'm in procrastination, the finishing the book, I had some of our community people to write a chapter on some of the things that they might want to share with the community, but I did have them to emphasize on something that they were experienced in as far as beginning the Dallas. Then some of them I asked, what are they doing in the middle part of the history of the Indians and then also the latter part, depending on when they came in. Mm -hmm. And so I've got a good genre of uh, topics and of writers, and we're no writers at all. These are just common folks that are putting things together. But the great thing was that they didn't turn me down. They didn't say, I can't write. But the, I just told them, said, we're all learning together. And I said, mm -hmm. we can't write. And so they were uh, glad to do that. And so from there, uh, I've got most, I've got nearly all of the chapters. It's just my job to try and pull it together and make it into a readable history for our, our narrative, for our people here, especially the parents and the grandkids. And then the community, the future community that needs to know what's happened to the history of American Indians. And ours are probably the only one that's about, about American Indian here in the Dallas area. There has not been any other books written mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. our people. So 
ours would be uh, unique in that aspect. But we have a lot of connections from to other uh, major cities in the city and then Indian country or United States that are relocation center because that's where I, we all came back to Texas, mm -hmm. the relocation center, and there were at least 11 to 13 more relocation centers throughout the United States. And we all have similar stories. And I think that uh, as far as I know, there's never been a book written such as the one that we're, we're, I'm working on. So I think that'd be very unique and I think very particularly interesting to our Indian communities. Yes, yes. You know. So as you write it, I'm dropping a copy. I was just right. saying. Go ahead and put me on the list. We're going to call the... Oprah. Um, Get it on her book club. Oprah. <laughs> because I'm reading it. Okay, I know I am. Um, I can't wait for you to finish it. So, you know, please, by all means. Yes, thank yes. you, thank you. And take your time, right? Um, even in procrastination, the work that you're you're doing in bringing people together for them to recount their stories is so meaningful. So this is why I can't do a meaningful introduction. Like, did y'all just? Yeah, it's just powerful. <laughs> <laughs> it's really powerful. It's true. All right, right Brian. And you have to, to follow your mom. <laughs> um, how do you talk to <laughs> Hello, Toast and Gold. My name is Brian Lardy, um, Executive Director for American Indian Heritage Day in Texas, and also Indian Citizens Against Racial Exploitation. And, you know, I, I think that what I try to do is achieve and be the um, legacy, but also carry sacred heirlooms of what my parents did. And that's the um, state law, which is American Indian Heritage Day, which we celebrate in the last Friday of um, in se last Friday in September, then also taking down all the DISD mascots, mm -hmm. American Indian mascots and DISD in 98. And so that's where, from what Mob tried to do is make sure we create more equality and in, in equity for American Indians across different platforms for diversity. And it's, that's the simplest way I can say it without really um, divulging into a lot more other aspects, but um, I think with that part that we do all have a lot more because the reason I keep it very simple is is because it's too um, too much um, the spectrum is too far and too great yeah. because it's what I'm trying to do is tackle um, all the historical threads of trauma that are wrapped in genocide of history, and mm -hmm. that's not a, an overnight or ten minute issue and so i think that's what's ongoing but i think that's responsibility of what i'm trying to do but also have the uh, narrative for our organization to take but also bring other alliances with us that are native and non-native to make sure we um, have a serum of truth because i think that's how humanity can survive is that knowing not the historical part but knowing the people in actuality but knowing how our ceremonies, traditions, and even our dialects make a difference in our own, you know, our own cultural preservation, but also how do you narrate it as a cultural tourism perspective too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Love it. So, you know, a lot of people would say, what on earth does opera have to do with any of this? You know, what, why? You know, a lot of people say that. And I would challenge you uh, to get rid of that thinking right away. Anytime you are dealing with an art form that tells the story of humanity and people and connection, this is what this is about. This is about tying different communities together, okay? Uh, looking and celebrating our differences while also, also understanding we also have common ground. And uh, the two people on the show with us today are, are two of the people who have made it a point to not only use um, art to create beauty, but the art is in, uh, use arts activism, use art as activism. Um, Elder Peggy, you heard her explain so eloquently about the book that she is putting together uh, and the educational uh, strides that they have made within the state of Texas alone. Uh, they have done so much work in this regard and that is why we are bringing them back. They have been with us before. Um, but very soon they have an event coming up at the end of this month as they begin to, uh, as Brian talked about earlier. So we want to make sure that we give them a platform. We want to advertise. We want to talk with them 
just about just as fellow co uh, community members, uh, but also talk about uh, the tie-ins that we see here because we, uh, as as I said, one of the things we've always talked about on this particular program is truth telling. Yep. We're getting down to the knit and the grit, and there has been a lot of myth and a lot of propaganda that has been put forth about communities who were pushed out, communities who faced murder, genocide, just like we were just talked about. Um, and the, one of the reasons why we want to continue to do this is that if we are to continue to heal and push toward the healing that is needed in this nation, needed in this nation, we have to begin with truth. We Thank must you. begin with truth. And one of those things is looking at the area that you live in. And you heard Elder Peggy just talk about how what she's doing is specific to Dallas and how it's unique. So it's very important that we have people around to help us tell the full narrative. So um, before I, let me step off my soapbox for a second, but I, I wanted to make sure that I pointed that out because like I said, um, I have learned, I have learned so much in just talking with the two of them. I've learned so much just about the, the, the history of, of this country. Um, because when you, when you hear it through one set of, when you hear it through a narrative, right, uh, that has been put forth to you, and then you begin doing your own research and talking to people, you start putting together a great of narrative. And then you begin to see where some of the holes are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of the flat out lies. Some flat, of out lies. flat out lies. That's why I say holes because it's nothing to stand on. It's a hole. It's a and so I'm very glad you all are here with us today. And Elder Peggy, you talked about your passion for education and and truth telling. Uh, uh, truth tell I have words. Truth telling. Um, do you see any challenges, given that, particularly given the work that you have done within the state of Texas uh, and, and rallying uh, to, mm -hmm. to our government and such and our leaders, um, what challenges do you see in current education and how can, how can organizations support? Yeah. Well, uh, with the, what they call the Native American slash indigenous curriculum, Mm -hmm. Basically, it's, uh, in you know, just a common person like me, when I hear the word curriculum, I always think about books. But in this case, it's not particularly in the educational terminology. They're talking about a strand that gives suggestions to teachers. Uh, for instance, the American Indians would be given suggestions. You can talk about this and give a little bit, expounding on a little bit more of that. And so teachers have choices of, in different topics, such as in art, such as in literature, uh, geography, and different things. And uh, they have different uh, topics that they can choose from and teach. So it's not, uh, you know, like I said, curriculum is meaning one thing for me, whereas uh, for the educational people is the strand. And so that's where it is now. The strand has been started. Of course, our organization called our local Indian people to come in about two, three years ago and tell them what was happening because our Indian people never know what's going on. Nobody ever tells us. So mm. since I knew, and Brian and I, through our organization, we pulled in as many Indians as we could one Saturday to give the opportunity for them to provide input. What would they like to see at that time with our curriculum? What would they like to see in this book? Because this was not going to be the standard social study type of books. So this uh, ethnic curriculum was supposed to be freer where mm -hmm. we could tell the truth, tell our stories, and tell stories that hasn't been told in the open uh, audience. And so that's where uh, we started. Then there's a disagreement between me and one of the uh, person that was on there that thought he knew a little bit more about Indian history when his is very inaccurate. Mm -hmm. So uh, we thought, well, if he wants to run it, let him run it. <laughs> and uh, eventually some other Indians came from the community, stepped in and started carrying the ball to where uh, they finished it the Grand Prairie School District uh, had approved it uh, where they were testing it in their own classes. Mm -hmm. and they submitted it to the TEA, uh, Texas Education Association. And throughout the summer, uh, right before the summer started, they had gone for the first 
public hearing. They were told at that time, we need you to change some of these wordings. But also the group already knew that last year, the SBC uh, 319, I think, and then it was changed into something else. That they could not tell about American Indian history. Mm -hmm. And they had to leave out the Trail of Tears. Uh, uh -huh. mm. And so, you know, if you can't tell about American Indian history, you can't really tell about American history at all. But in some people's mind, that was just too horrible for the, uh, I guess, white students to learn. And so they wanted to leave that out of whitewashing history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, so our, our committee took a chance, the committee uh, from Grand Prairie took a chance and wrote it the way they saw fit, including everything that should be in there. Uh -huh. To the TEA first reading, TEA kicks it back saying that you need to reword some of these and some of these need to be changed to different areas with the possibility they might have been said that we may take this out of social studies and we may move this into another general category, educational category. But that was just talk. And so the group came back and rewrote what they were told to, took it back uh, within this past uh, month of August. Mm -hmm. I guess they thought it was going to get passed because they did what was asked of them. And a lot of these were community people. They were not educators. However, there were Latino educators, there were indigenous educators sitting on this committee. The time that I was involved, I was the only Indian. Mm -hmm. These others thought they knew just a little bit more than I did because they were educators, masters and PhD. Oh, and I don't have no PhD with my name, but I did. I do have the heritage, full blood Indian, but they didn't listen to that. So uh, I guess maybe with mine and Brian pulling out, I guess maybe they listened a little bit more to the new group coming in. But uh, during the month of August, they rewrote everything and took it back within the past three, two weeks. And mm. it was turned down. Mm. And mm. they're very upset because they don't know what had happened. But if you stay with politics, you knew what was happening. The Republicans were trying to take everything away. Mm. And that happened to the uh, African-American curriculum. Mm -hmm. They said slavery was too tough to teach to kids. Right. What kids are they talking about when all these kids go to movies and TVs and see all these murders and they, anything and everything you can think of that society mm -hmm. Uh, is promoting. Mm -hmm. And then when you want to hear the truth, it's too hard for it's these kids. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's one, for instance, that they said the slaves had to sleep on the floor of the boat before they came over. They said, my kids can't hear that. That's too horrible. Guess what else was happening on those boats? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the same and, thing with the Hispanics. Yeah. And, and yeah. the truth of it is that the kids who who have a closer experience to this, right? Or the kids who have to live it, right? Regardless, taking it out of textbooks does not change it. It is still something that we have to teach our kids. Mm -hmm. And I grew up the same way in that there were things that were not shared in the textbook, but my parents made it a point to educate me about these things, to make sure that I knew to make sure that I knew the truth. There were summer schools and things that we went to to make sure that we knew the truth. So hiding it out of the textbooks does not make it go away. And it certainly doesn't make it go away for the descendants uh, of kids who have direct connection to these to these events because of their identities, right? Mm -hmm. You can't hide it. The Trail of Tears, you, you can't hide it because as we teach kids and as we teach children, where they come from so that they have a better understanding of where they want to go. It has to be there and it has to be present. Having said that, on the other hand, we have a lot of parents that are busy trying to raise themselves and mm -hmm. grandparents are raising the kids. Grandparents are worn out nowadays that they don't have teach time to teach. And then these kids are so busy into their cell phones, everything else, as well as television, they don't want to hear history. In most situations, mm. and so you know, we're going to lose those kids with uh, that could have been exceptional kids that might have been able to remember the history and 
uh, have, you know, that would have been a valuable information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and then, you know, the white kids are no different. They're so, and they're raising themselves and they got money so they can go do whatever they want to. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know there's exceptional kids. Uh -huh. uh, yes, oh, and all cool. that, but on the, on the average, we have those type of kids. Uh, the other thing is that kind of going back to the powwow, uh, we use, uh, Brian really been pushing equity and quality because mm -hmm. Indians have not experienced that in the city of Dallas anywhere mm -hmm. because our Indians, we just don't have the leaders that are out there talking that way. Yes. Cause they, uh, there's just nobody taking time off from work to do that. Uh, there's no, as I mentioned before, there's no organizations or no clubs or anything that's for our Indian youth children. Uh, there's, we've got a small limited uh, social health services that's under federal government, so they can do only so much. And they work from eight to five and that's it. Yeah. And yeah. so they don't do anything else for the Indian community. And so, you know, we lose that and we, uh, as uh, Brian goes to, but uh, as uh, we are also learning that as we're promoting powwow in the general public, they don't even know what powwow is. Mm. They could care less, especially when we need donations. We're for a couple of big uh, donors didn't come through mm. because they don't realize how important cultural preservation, cultural tourism, or equity and quality is to American Indians. Especially to a nonprofit organization, mm -hmm. especially ours as one is put on powwow. They don't understand it because they've never have never had to deal with it. They don't mm -hmm. even know what a powwow is and how important it is to them. For them to know that the American Indian history can survive here in Dallas if they take time to learn. Mm -hmm. But they need to come out to our people. But if they come out just to watch dancers and to look at the food and the vendors. You know, they, they're going to lose out on the uh, educational that they could have been picking up. Nice. Uh, if they contact us, you know, Brian will give them all the information that they need. Because so many of them, as I mentioned before, I've had educators even come up to me and say, well, I didn't know there were still Indians alive, or I didn't realize there were Indians in the city of Dallas. Things haven't changed that much. And uh, mm. we have well-educated people come up to Brian and me teaching us about our own Indian culture. Yeah. It's ridiculous. So, very insensitive. It's, it's yeah. ridiculous. Um, so here's my question because, you know, you, you've talked very bluntly and openly about this, but the truth is the truth. And so my question is, what can, what can the public, you know, what could other organizations better do to support um, what you all are trying to accomplish, accomplish through your organization and through the upcoming powwow. We're going to get into that a little bit, a little bit later on. But what, what, can, what can people do to help? Well, all the other major ethnicity you can think of have a cultural center. American Indians, the only one that don't have a cultural center. Mm -hmm. But again, we lack leadership. We lack economic uh, influence. We lack, We don't have politic influence at all. We have nothing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we can't even push equity and quality. But mm -hmm. we need a cultural center. So we have a place where uh, non-Indians will know that they can come here and get information. Okay. We can put on cultural classes. We can do this and this to this, uh, share our knowledge, share our cultural uh, information with the general public. But we can't do it because we don't even have a meeting place to go to for general meetings uh, to mm. promote anything. We have to borrow from the Oak Cliff Cultural Center if we want to have some uh, activities. Uh, we go here and there using other people. We have nothing of our own. So that's one of the major things that we need to really have that will give us stability. Uh -huh. mm. And that will give us more credibility because when we apply for different things first thing is don't give us your post office box give right. us your mailing address right. i mean give us your uh, physical location yeah yeah i can't give them my home address because yeah. <laughs> that's why i use it most of the time for my address uh, for our uh, organization address but when 
I don't I, I can't invite people come to my house. Yes, yes, but yeah. I had nothing yes. to show, you know, if they wanted to see what do you have for the Indians? Yeah, you know, I got pictures and everything, but that's not for my place to have that type of meeting. Uh-huh. And so it's a definite need for a cultural center. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm here in space, right? In right. stable space and what mm-hmm. that means. And in a lot of lot of ways organizations, particularly organizations um, that are indigenous, black, people of color, um, organizations, that's one of the big spaces to have the foundation of space. And how interesting for us to have a conversation about space on land when we know that the land and the use of the land has not been equitable and it has not been equal. It has not been fair, right? And it has not been humane. So I'm hearing that organizations um, in ways to not just support, but to put their money where their mouth is to actively do something that is going to be meaningful. Uh, one of the starting points is space. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Stable yes. space. That's, yeah. Stable Location. Space. That's real. Nice. And we've been uh, asked to uh, sit in different meetings, different entities that's doing land acknowledgement. We tell them off the base, don't ask us to help do it. You need to go out and do the research first yourself. You got to learn the history. It's the white people, the non-natives that is involved. And basically, it's, they find they got to find out the truth. Uh-huh. They got to do some reconciliation uh, for there to be some racial healings, healing and understanding. And so... Uh, once they finally work on it, then they'll call us and say, what do you think about this and this? And then we have to remind them, if your organization is doing this, what is your organization going to promise to help the American Indian? Right. Right. Don't just give us words. We're going to hear land and knowledge, but don't give us those type of words. But what is your company or your organization willing to do to help the American Indians? Mm-hmm. And so well, and I can't, we can't build a cultural center with your words and platitudes. Right. You just told the people what you need. Mm-hmm. And so I hope all of you out there heard that. You heard what she said that you needed, that she mm-hmm. needed, right? Mm-hmm. What right. they need. They need a place. They need to build a stable place so they can be, because, because like I said, the two folks on this, this, this program right now, they are heavy into education. They are heavy into truth. And in order to be able to be able to do that, you heard what she just said. They need space. So please note that. And if anybody out there has an idea of how to help them, please, by all means, we'll, we'll make sure that we put contact information and all of that in, in when, we, when we post this. But you heard what she said. That is a very clear thing that she just said. Mm-hmm. So your words and your platitudes, that's all well and good. But you heard what she just said. She needs space. Right. And extending that uh, for organizations who are actively wanting to engage um, and to not just support, but to build relationships. Your words only go so far. Your words are for yourself to hear other people speak words. It's important, right? We start with a land and people acknowledgement because it is important, but it is the beginning of truth telling and for self understanding the history, understanding the impact, understanding where we're going forward, because it leads to connection and connection builds greater uh, greater ways to do things together when you're actually doing something. So connections grow and there is, they become stronger once you're actually doing something. Land and people acknowledgements only go so far, right? That's, mm-hmm. we just heard Elder Peggy say, don't, what are you promising? You, okay, you say this, but what are you going to do? What is the action that is behind this acknowledgement? What's the action? Now that you know truth, what are you going to do about it? Mm-hmm. So thank you for that, Elder Peggy, just dropping pearls. Just telling the truth. <laughs> it's always a truth. Um, and, uh, we asked. We, yes. We uh, asked because we wanted to know. And as full as this meal is about to be, I know um, in the things that, that are meaningful for us as we share space together, that Brian is just going to keep feeding us. Brian. <laughs> the truth. Um, Brian, uh, you you have such a multifaceted approach, right? Between you and Elder Peggy, it really is a, a force to be reckoned with, right? This powerhouse 
of wealth, of information, of truth telling, of accountability. In your work, also as an artist, um, you put these things together. We talk about arts activism and what it means as an artist to also speak truth to create change. Can you share about kind of some of your recent work, some of the messages of your recent work? And then I'll ask kind of some of the things that you have coming up. Okay. So um, the overall perspective of what I do with the art is to make a movement. And even then, when you see movements to civil rights, you see picket lines, you see protests, it's the main image they follow behind. And that's the genesis that actually creates a descriptive narrative, a creative implementation. It gives for, for you know, so many perspectives and narratives and directives of how to approach an issue the issue that you want to push for American Indians is not a tragedy, but else, but you try to show beauty and the resilience of what we have, our culture, our identity. And I always say that it's our world interpreted. It's our world to show what we want to. And at the same time as that, even for what the work that you see is done by our ancestors. Mm -hmm. and with our ancestors that you're looking at 547 tribes so even the just the pox that you see is the rights of relatives mm -hmm. from our ancestors mm -hmm. and that's the part where i try to show cultural significance the modernism but a palette of understanding but at the same time is there's always a narrative of education and understanding because when you see the work face value, you have no clue what you're looking at until I label everything behind and you're like, I didn't know this. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of parts where I don't say our work, our, my work is art. It's more cultural preservation because mm -hmm. in, in the realm of what I do, that there's no isms. I'm not worried about beauty. I'm worried about how our culture is presented. Uh -huh. Trying to make sure even authenticity is presented because each piece that I show might be in a museum. It may be from an elder that I know. It may come from, you know, a lineage of a legacy or a sacred heirlooms, but it may be something that's been handed down by family to family or nation to nation. And those are the parts of what we do for even with individuals that our ancestors are gone, but the old um, photos that you try to make sure you honor them as they honored us mm -hmm. because they were survivalists of genocide. And so even then, that's the preservation of artwork that you see. But for me, it's how do you make sure that our legacy still continues in that perspective of not artwork, but it's the part of heirlooms after a while. And so those are the narratives of how you look at it to see how you can, you can interpret it, translate it, then also be educated. But at the same time for us is that this is what is normal for us. The same time as that for y'all, it may for anybody else that sees it, it may be spectacular or something you've never seen before. The same time as that, is that a good or bad thing, or is that something that you never spent time learning about our legacy, our lineage? But I think the only way that you can educate, even from my perspective, is that I have to take time to understand about other other ethnic ethnicities lineage, their culture, make sure I understand historical value. And mm -hmm. if, if I'm going to take the time to learn someone else's grandparents' legacy, they should take the time to understand my grandparents' legacy from our ancestors. And I think those are the pieces where you look at what I'm able to do is to show the right appropriate way because so many has been done wrong of prejudice and racism and stereotypes. And that's my part where I can change our own voice through narrative, but at the same time is that we actually, with, with the talent that I've been able to give, I can actually change a craft to fit what I want to without any translation. And I think that's the part where if I present this piece out that, that has a design conceptual perspective that you're looking at it through an ethicist lens, that's where you see true beauty or the way it's supposed to be back in the day. Or you see that people 
save that from generation to generation. Okay. And if not, it may be someone else's interpretation of what it was back then. So basically everything we're doing is cultural history. And, um, but that's the part how I use it to our narratives of what we're trying to do with, pro with our projects because every one of them is always an education. There's always one one audience that doesn't know understand anything with American Indians. Mm -hmm. The other part is that we have to in introduce our whole culture to a different perspective. At the same time as that, I want to make sure even the design fits our own people that live the lifestyle and, and make sure that we're not dishonoring our own people, but we're making sure that we preserve it the right way where they said, well, you're doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. And I think those are the ways on how I see myself from even doing fine art back then to what I'm doing now as far as, you know, digital archive, but also, di you know, more digital branding because you have to, for me, I have to see American Indian as branding of our culture because it's been torn so badly apart. Mm -hmm. People don't know what's what and they don't know what art pieces tied to what people within our circles but the same time as that this isn't pretty but the same time as that when i'm designing i'm still fighting what other designers non-native do in commercials what they mm. do um marketing what they do in hollywood and also what they do as non-natives that feel spiritually or romanticized huh. follow the american indian perspective and that's the part where, where what I'm actually able to do is change a narrative because, like you said, this is equity and this is our power and we can maintain it. But at the same time as that, would you follow American full-blood American Indian or American Indian or would you follow a non-native that has a professor, you know, title to their name? Hmm. And hmm. what is the lineage of being American Indian if you don't want to listen to us. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> um, you know, people get those letters behind their name and they start tripping. So um I, I hope you all heard what he was saying because um and, and what Elder Pe Peggy was saying earlier. There is a um a habit of, of getting credentials. Um, and I'm not knocking getting credentials. I have a few myself. Quo has 75 million. Um, <laughs> and I counting. I have this thing <laughs> about higher institutional learning. It's the whole thing. But. <laughs> but, but my point is, is that there are things that you're, you know, we, there are things that you cannot capture in data and podcasts. Right, right. There are things that you cannot capture in a textbook. There are things that you actually have to, Elder Peggy said earlier, the people that she went and talked to were regular, common everyday folks. Yep. Right. They're not, she said they were not writers, but they want they they wanted to tell the story and they willingly came and told the story. We have to be uh, better about doing that. Right. Uh, we have to be better about bringing people in who you, who you deem is unconventional. Well, who's convention? Right. According to who's convention and who's qualifications, because that's who's it. most qualified to share these stories, those who yeah. live them. And that's a big challenge for a lot of our organizations because we're so used to certain track. And I say our royal hour in opera in particular, because we're so used to, oh, opera is great. This is what we've learned about opera. Let's go into your community and here's what you, here's opera. Um, and what Brian just shared in this wealth of perspective in creating pieces with the intention that they are representing truthfully ancestors, that they are representing truthfully the people who are here, that they will be heirlooms for people who will follow. How many of our opera companies are looking at programming or looking at works in such a way? And then to do so in a way that is honest, to do so in a way that tells the truth and to do so in a way that recognizes the nuances of different communities. You can't just put something on stage and say, hey, here, this is art. There you go. We are actively creating experiences. We're actively creating works. Are they worthy of being heirlooms? That's what I'd like for us to truly consider. Are we intentional about what we are putting on stage? Are we intentional about the works we uphold? And are we intentional about learning the impact of those works and the nuances of how those works impact different communities? 
So thank you for that, uh, Brian and uh, Elder Peggy. Just, I love talking to y'all all the time. Yeah, <laughs> this is why I can't do a proper introduction. <laughs> there is no proper introduction. No, I, I, no, I feel you on that. And something that, you know, just stuck out to me, you know, there are a lot of things that we have in, inherited, you know, as, as an art form. And I don't know that anybody's asked themselves these questions because that's real talk. Mm -hmm. um, the bottom line is there are a lot of stories that have not been told or stories that were written and are not considered canon and all right. these types of things. And my question is that that is a really good question. So when you said, are, is, is this going to be an heirloom? Is, is this worthy of being an heirloom? That is real talk. What do you want your descendants to, to know about you and, and, your, and the culture? And uh, what do you want them? Are they going to are they going to be sitting in an audience cringing? Uh, at, at some at something you know, or is it something that they can? And don't get me wrong, that you know, art is going to bring out different emotions and all this kind of stuff, and we want to continue to do that. But there are works that have twenty first century implications right now um, that were not there, you know, in, in the nineteenth century, you know. Well, so we have to ask ourselves these questions. So Brian, thank you for talking about that. Thank you for talking about capturing the culture and honoring uh, your ancestors and telling the truth but also making sure the people that you're working with now are doing this for now are well represented too. That is real talk. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. real talk. We could do a whole show on that alone. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, you all have um, an exciting and um, extensive uh, event coming up, right? The powwow. So I'd like to take some time and um, we're with y'all. We're rocking with y'all all month. So I'd like to yep. take some time just to let people know about it. And then in particular, uh, Elder Peggy, you said people don't even know what the what a powwow is. So I'd like to open this space for you to share whatever you'd like to share uh, about the, the upcoming River of Canoes. The River Canoes Powwow is scheduled for September 24 and 25 at Trinity River Park at the Trinity River. Uh, and this is uh, off a uh, Sylvian Bridge that connects from one side of Oak Cliff to the other side of Uptown. And the river bottom is at the bottom. The reason we're using this space and the title is because it's River of the Canoes referencing the water. Water is very, very important. We wanted to have a water ceremony early that morning before the powwow starts, giving thanks to Mother Earth and for the waters that she provides. Mm -hmm. Water, as we know, is very, very important, getting more important to, today now, mm -hmm. uh, because if we don't have water and don't drink water for several days, and it uh, you know, it can really put us into a tailspin with our health and everything else. And so it's very important. But there's also other people that want to make money off of the water line mm. because they can use pipeline for oil and energy to go through uh, that route. And the Indians have been fighting, especially four or five years ago. There was a big skirmish about it. And... Um, but a uh, poor, poor media coverage on it. So mm -hmm. hardly nobody knows about it except us Indians. And so uh, we want to make the Dallas people realize that because Trinity River is a, a body of water, that it carries very important message, yeah. carries very important value to ecological uh Anything and everything you think of that in reference to outdoor, to uh, to science, to uh, water, to uh, animals, to birds that lives there, as well as to human being. But uh, so that's the main purpose why we're wanting to have it there, uh, because it's also also our tenth anniversary for the American Indian Heritage Day in Texas, which is the state law that last Friday in September be set aside and observed as a contribution that the American Indians had made to the people, to the state of Texas. And that's to cover the, uh, the historical value that uh, we know that comes through the land acknowledgement. We also know that uh, there's 
many other factors that goes into recognizing contribution, not only arts and crafts, mm -hmm. as a uh, non-native would think that it is made to the state of Texas, but we go way beyond that. And Brian will go more into detail about the powwow in a few minutes, but the word powwow is, uh, sometimes it's uh, today's time, we accept it as a social gathering of American Indians in many situations, especially like in Dallas, because a lot of tribes are going to come together because there's this is not a homeland to any Indian reservation. Right. And so uh, many tribes are going to come together and still remember the sacredness of the circle, the sacredness of the dances, sacred, sacredness of the uh of the songs. And then we start with prayer and we end with a prayer because everything is sacred mm -hmm. when we get into the dancing circle. And we mm -hmm. encourage people, no drinking, no drugs. Right. Many times they observe that, but then, you know, today's time, sometimes people don't observe it too. So we try to watch that and that it doesn't happen. And so it's a sacred event. If you go into Oklahoma, it's very, very sacred because it's going to be on a particular homeland of the tribes that's having the powwow. And sometimes it's not really open to the public. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a sacredness ceremonies that's involved uh, for, for that particular tribe. But here in Dallas, it's open to everybody. And uh, our invitation is to both Indians and non-Indians to come. It's free of charge. It's open to all ages. You come whenever you want to and you leave whenever you want to. Our program will be starting about, uh, we want to have water ceremony about 10 o'clock. Our powwow uh, schedule will start about uh, 1 o'clock. We'll have a call to uh, what we call all the Indians that are there, especially in the regalia, but don't have to be in the regalia. Women can have shawls that come in to the dancing circle if they have, uh, if they belong to an organization or to a group that's pertinent to the powwow uh, scene. After that is over, there's going to be a gore dancing. Gore dancing, many times we call it old man's dancing, but it's more than that. Uh -huh. It's sacred. A circle of men that comes together because they were veteran hmm. and come in with that recognition. It's more open now to younger people, to grandkids to come in because they got to teach the tradition. If they don't do it, they can lose that with uh, the young ones. If they're not taught to appreciate it, the young ones may not want to do it when they're old enough to participate. So that goes for probably until about four o'clock. We'll have a summer break, a su supper break. During that time, we're going to have a stickball uh, game that's going to be played by our local stickball group here that is part of our organization, but they use a lot of community people. Stickball is basically a forerunner to lacrosse, is what we say, but it's an old, old Indian tradition that the Indians used to settle and many times settle. Uh, arguments or mm -hmm. sometimes just having that particular people with their particular tradition to observe stickball and the particular dances that go with that. So it depends on sometimes on what tribes, but here in Dallas, because we're urban, it's going to be a stickball. And then six o'clock, we'll come back again with our, and if we have any deacon chairs, we'll have them come in, uh, speak on behalf of our of our law and of our people here. And then we'll have our uh, <clears throat> call to dance and where everybody comes in their beautiful dresses, the regalias. And this is the evening where we're going to have uh, our young men come in their dancing regalia. They'll be made out of feathers. They'll be made out of roaches uh, with the beautiful outfits. And uh, then uh, we'll probably about 7, 7.30, we're going to have all the young kids, six five years and under uh -huh. come into the dancing circle and they're going to dance and then they're going to get a little gift, a little uh, giveaway and uh, maybe $2 for participating and maybe some candy. But we got to introduce them somewhere. Yes, yes. Especially in the Dallas, we have what is called Urban Indians. 
they're not so in tune with their tradition anymore because most of them are half ethnicity of other or half Indian and half other ethnicity. And so, you know, they're struggling to live in Dallas and they're struggling to be accepted into whatever circle they want to be. Also trying to learn which ethnicity do I kind of live in? Mm -hmm. And so they got more, I think, struggles, survival struggle that they have to go through. And sometimes their parents or grandparents not there to help them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, the Indian community in Dallas is not there to help them. And so we got to try to do what we can do to help out. And so that kind of gives you, and we'll, hopefully we'll go up into about 10 and we'll finish, then we'll come back Sunday morning and we'll have a lot of contesting, different specialty of dances with uh, uh, well-known dancers of the, that type of contest. And at the end of the evening, uh, they'll be ranked one, two, three, and they get some money for coming down and for displaying their dancing expertise. So uh, we hope to stop about noontime Sunday and hope for finish by eight o'clock uh, that night. So our people will be able to travel back to Oklahoma. We'll have a lot of people coming in from Oklahoma uh, for our dancing and to support us. So that's what I quick uh, run down on our uh, lineup. And now Brian and Callan go more into detail on the uh, powwow and rest of the setup. Mm -hmm. And so, um, since we talked about equity and equality, that I have to step backwards, and this campaign is all about equity and equality. It's about, um, you know, the reason why we're having the powwow on the rivers, because back then, if you look through Dallas, there's no American Indian representation. There's no landmarks. There's mm -hmm. no um, represent you know more more visual interpretation of who was here and i think that's the worst part is that i can go to the founders plaza and there's no american indians cool. Cool. i can go around but the only thing of us are street names yeah names yeah and yep. so there's nothing inside that really gives that depth of american indians inside when you know that um if you know or if you don't know that american Indians were here and you, you said it perfect you don't stay on stolen land unless there's a reason why you don't say also on land if you took the history value also you don't say it's also on land if if you've been erased from history so how do you know if it's stolen land if you've been genocide by every perspective mm -hmm. and so Ooh. What, yeah. we're, what we're doing before that is that um, the river, which everybody knows that the only way you got from A to B back then is a safe travels through American Indian land. And the only way you went through is trade routes. So people know trade routes is land, but they also need to understand what trade routes were water also. And so mm -hmm. this was a trade route. And I tell people, I said, well, how do you know that? How did you not know that, Amer you know, that Dallas was only created only by closer to the river and the river was a land import and export business yep. and that's the only way you got things in here to this area and the way that um we named river canoes because the spaniard had named tree river in historical documentation asked well what do you call the what was the name before and they said river canoes well, who do you think were on those river? What are uh -huh. those canoes on that river? And if you didn't know it was American Indians, then you don't know history and who you, you traded with. And even the founders aren't founders because they were immigrants from Kentucky and Tennessee. And that's in Dallas history. So what, what we're trying to do is having, you know, the powwow is basically a subliminal protest. So we're trying to have the name changed Archicosa and the new narrative now is Archicosa is not a name, a dialect name, but it's actually the, an ancient ancestral tribe now. So they were extinct. Mm. So we're trying to change the name for the people that are called Archicosa now, but change the river to Archicosa because that predated, you know, even the Caddo's 
Mm-hmm. But at the same time is that that's what we're trying to do as far as name association. And the other part is that in the um, directive is that we're trying to honor Mother Earth. We're trying to honor the rivers. We're trying to honor and save climate change. We're also trying to build ecologists. In in the new in the new world, we're gonna need more ecologists to understand what's going on because we do a great job of tearing it up or not understanding the responsibility of what we're doing now. But mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. the hard part is that if the people up here keep continuing, then we need another people down here to grow and young and start understanding how they can be that be those people not to hold people accountable, but also accept the responsibility to become to become their own survivors of their own future and be able to change or cure or sustain what we've messed up. Mm-hmm. And so even if you haven't done it, we're still products of. And right. I think that's the responsibility that, no, I didn't do it. Well, it's our generation. And I think that's the hardest part. So that's where this directive is. So even then, you you gave a land acknowledgement. And so even then on that land, I'm trying to change rule, regulations, and policies. So I'm trying to, you know, change it where, how come you can say land acknowledgement in different parts of Dallas, but you can't say, you know, that's nationwide also. But you can't say for us, you got land acknowledgement for American Indians in parks. Mm -hmm. In federal, you do have exemptions for ceremonial gatherings, but in the city of Dallas, there's nothing like that. Hmm. So that's what needs to be changed if you're going to do a land acknowledgement. And mm-hmm. so it's actions beyond words. And then the other part is that down the line after is like, well, what's your learn- long-term goal? And we want to start building um, a platform where we can get more eco campuses come with. And that's where we get seven-year-olds, 10-year-olds, that kind of age range to start, start learning from the people we know that are knowledgeable, but under the American Indian umbrella, how to start approaching ecology through an urban perspective. How do you start looking at, a lot of people don't know rivers are connected. They just think it cuts off and they don't know that's the veins coming from Canada all the way down south. And so when you don't know that rivers are connected, then you don't know that one river affects as a ripple effect. And so even before you get to the powwow and that's the equity that we're trying to push Mm -hmm. so with this one is that it's not about a political part but it's more giving back to the ancestral people and Mm -hmm. the other part is that you know with what we're trying to do we're trying to give voices to the cattle nation where they can you don't know you can't say well, I wish I knew them. Well, they're in front of your face. Mm-hmm. I can talk to them. It, you know, you need to invite them through the sovereign nation perspective. You, you need to treat them the way they should be treated as a nation. And the other part is that they have to have their own voice. But if we're going to go through the city of Dallas lands, is that they need to do the right appropriation to honor them for them to be here. Because... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Our our culture and preservation or our tradition is someone else's marketing dream. So we got to make sure that doesn't get blurred or distorted. So mm-hmm. there's right, the way I'm trying to make sure is we have right procedures on how to have an introduction, how, to, how you nego- negotiate conversations. But that's not the new converse versus what other what the United States does with any other country. Uh-huh. Yeah. Different province. So it's nothing new. But how do you say all that when they mistreated all the treaties? Uh-huh. And so that's the way you can rewrite history is start rethinking how you do treaty perceptions of how you acknowledge but how you work with, work again with those that's been mistreated through a government lens. And mm-hmm. so those those are things that um, we look at, but at the same time is that we're trying to make sure that our voice of American Indians is more knowledgeable. We're trying to make sure that through us, it's a cultural preservation, but to somebody else, it's a cultural tourism. Mm-hmm. We're trying to make sure that what we can do as a community, make sure that we give Dallas a relationship bridge where they can 
walk into it, be interacted with our community, but at the same time, do it the right way. But at the same time, as the Dallas needs to know that American Indians are equitable and equality in that range where we don't need you, but at the same time, you can benefit from us. Mm -hmm. And the other part is that with that with that lens that it shows how strong we are and our strengths, but also how we're, you know, how much we look at our culture, not to share, but to make sure we hand it off in the right way. And so those are the ways with every other platform that we try to make sure that we maintain our, um, our way of life. But at the same time is that, you know, it's not just our American Indian community from Dallas, they forget that all of our tribes are in are interconnected with nationwide yeah. um, sovereign nations, and then if you're speaking to us, that means you're speaking to other nations. If you're in a tribal, you're speaking to so many nations beyond. But all of us are relatives, so we're all tied together. So that's the part where if you're gonna do it right, you do it right the first time. And but that's the, what we're after because you shouldn't be treating anybody bad in the first place. Uh huh. But I think that in the right way that respect comes into the right, the right, um, you know, narrative of how you treat anybody. And like I said, is that if you don't know your culture, then I can't talk to you because my grandparents and your grandparents can't talk with each other. And that's the part where our culture, we have to give it 100%. But at the same time is that if you're going to walk in our world, you need to know your culture. If not, you better get a crash course or call somebody because you want to understand of what we're trying to do with preservation. And I think that's the way people research us in the wrong way because they technically they need to research themselves first. Mm -hmm. But at the same time is that when you look at it through that cultural lens is that why do we have to tell you anything? A lot of other ways, you, when you go vacation to other countries, guess what? You learn their language, you learn their history, you buy different books, you watch different movies, you understand where you're going to for how many days? Probably eight days, but you learn that much in order to compact it to this much to where you feel like you blend in. But if American Indians were here first, before all the ships and before all the conquering happened, how come you still don't learn? Ooh. How come you still don't see us as the narrative of the beginning? And, you know, all of our people back then didn't have flags. And that was a European perception. So, you know, you stand behind what, you know, and, you know, I think that's the hardest part is that with American Indians, it's not being fascinated. It's not being amazed or ood. I think that's a part where our people are doing the best job of preserving our own culture. But I tell everybody, I said, you know, that with who we are as, as the one people, uh, and, and I say this, and I, and I go challenge, challenge me to be wrong, is that we're the most celebrated of our culture in the whole summer. And powwows are going every weekend in the summer. There's four or five. There may be one in Canada, maybe one down here, maybe mm -hmm. one in Oklahoma, Montana. But if you know all the tribes, everybody's having one. And, you know, I think, you know, last two weeks, I think one weekend had five or six. Another one had four or five. And, you know, and that's just the way it goes. But if we're preserving our culture that much, how come no one else is watching? How, my, how come no one else understands that? But if you're not seeing that, then, you know, you, I don't think you'll ever get the American Indian perspective of why we're preserving our tradition. But at the same time as that, I learned from the ancestors and my parents that you welcome anybody because education is supposed to be free. Culture preservation is supposed to be shared and not um, silenced. And so those are the parts where we need to make sure on our side, we honor and respect everybody else who walks through our, the doors that come see us or walks through the areas that want to know more. Mm -hmm. But Either you, either we're going to do our job the right way or they'll get the wrong perception through a film or some other person who assumes mm -hmm. that this is what we're saying or this is the way our history is. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions, but at the same time is that this is our lens to make sure that we tell our stories the right way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Well, yeah, and, and the thing is, th there's, a, there's a natural gatekeeping that has to happen with something like that. And so it's completely understandable that you want to tell your own stories and talk about your own culture. Um, and also be very careful about when you hand that over that the, whoever you're handing it over to understands that as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and being very, uh, uh, and ma making sure that you have uh, control of that. That makes absolute sense. It makes absolute sense. And it's like we were talking, you know, even before we, we, we started recording about just making sure that things are respectful and done right. And how you said that it starts with, with me first. I have to be, I have to make sure right. that that what you said it earlier where it was cultural pre preservation for me is cultural tourism, aka money making for somebody else. So you have to be very careful about not only what you uh, uh, teach, but how you teach it. And to whom? You know, and mm -hmm. to whom? Mm -hmm. And, and even in hearing, you know, you respect everybody and people are welcome, but I also hear you are welcome, but you need to know who you are. Because mm -hmm. we know yep. who we are, right? I know who I am. Yep. You come to me in order for us to have this conversation. You need to know who you are. And it is it is not, I don't even want to say productive. It is not uh, equitable. It is not meaningful to want to engage with any communities without being able to understand one's own history mm -hmm. so that you can respect so that you can honor and so that you can share in the history of others. So uh, we have a lot of organizations who are always opera companies in particular, who are wanting to engage with uh, Native American, American Indian, Indigenous, First Nation, right? People in Canada as well, um, uh, First Nation communities. And this is the call to action. Don't come up in here. <laughs> Expect to be able to teach you everything if you yourself have not put in the work to learn more about your own culture, your own history, and the connections or lack thereof, um, as well as to put in the work and the effort to learn about the spaces you're going into. And I'm I'm hearing and I, I appreciate so much, Brian, the the concrete perspective of if you were to engage in any other nation. Mm -hmm. This is what yeah. you do. The hard part is that um, a lot of people think of us as not in the right perspective, that they have a linear mindset where we have a holistic approach and it's more organic where people are thinking about five minutes, we're thinking about seven generations. And that's just what, um, you know, we learn from the oral history, but at the same time is that, you know, our perspectives are different. But at the same time, it's misconceived, but it's a lot of part is that they learn about it later, but they learn about that from other cultures beside their own. Mm -hmm. And that's because the teaching isn't about the world and, you know, leaving it as, leaving it as it was before, leaving it better. But same time is how much can you tear away to get your deadlines and status quo as far as who you are, but you're not, you're not representing who you're lineage is or your legacy are. Oh, Brian, you said Brian. a mouthful right there. Your deadlines and your status quo. Your deadlines and your narratives and your status quo and being mindful of the impact. Like you said, there's like the five minutes. Let's say the season, next season. Let's say two years, right? We, we think out in opera, let's say five years from now. And you, and you just said, we're thinking seven generations ahead. So why would I engage with you and your opera company if you're going to cause us harm so that you can get something done within the next three years when I'm worried about making sure that there is healing, that there's connection seven years from now? Seven the generations. Real foundation that continues. Yeah. Yes, yes. Seven yes. generations from now. You're looking at five years because you want this opera to happen and you want this community to show up. But I'm thinking about how that's going to impact my people seven generations from now. And if we we start conversations without understanding the intent and the impact of our approach and our actions, then this is where we end up in the space where we, we can't share space together, where we can't connect, where we can't speak truth. Yeah. 
and where we can't shift so that opera can be the vessel that it is meant to be in serving yeah. people and bringing people together. Yeah, and it is, and that you, in order to be able to do that, the storytelling that 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 is opera, you really have to start looking at it, particularly through some of the things that Brian said, because that's applicable. That's applicable whether you're putting on a play, you're putting on an opera, a symphonic work, whatever it is. Whether you're a museum. Museum. Oh, my yeah. word, whether you're yeah. a museum. Absolutely. Uh, you have to ask yourself uh, the, these particular uh, questions, particularly if you are in charge of programming or you are in charge of uh, the, engaging with your community. Uh, it's it's real talk. And so it, it sort of brings back to how, how, how open the ep- when we opened the episode is how do these two things connect? <laughs> this American Indian Heritage Day in Texas connect with opera where well, you've heard it here. You've heard it here. And the biggest thing that has talked we talked about is narrative and how we share narrative. Brian said we have to make sure that we have to hand it when we hand it off to somebody else that we've taught it well enough. That's real talk. And there's a responsibility. Brian, Brian said I have a responsibility my, myself, right? Before I hand it off to somebody else or invite somebody else in. That is real talk. And we talked about, you know, examining your own house. Uh-huh. You know, before you go and, and tell somebody else that theirs is not in order. So yeah. that's, we get in the episode right there. That's <laughs> <where we're going. laughs> I think, I think the other, and, uh, <laughs> I think the other part was, um, you know, I had conversation with the and there were in order to do this bridge. And I told him and said, we have the same voice. I said, we're all about, and we talked about earlier, it's all about mm-hmm. storytelling. Mm-hmm. There is no manuscripts of what American Indian history is. It's all told by, you know, voice, told by ancestors. And the hardest part is I tell them, I said, yeah, to me, I hold a higher standard for the opera world because y'all are telling stories that people that, that are ethnicities are now Americans and they lost their culture mm-hmm. at the same time as that they're trying to reclaim who they were, but no one tells them in the operatic profession that they need to change the dialect. If it's an Italian, they need to change their, um, you know, the we call regalia, but what they wear, that has to be authentic. The music has to be authentic. The language has to be authentic. Yeah, yeah. The background has to be authentic. Mm-hmm. And that part is that you're telling tragedies. And the hardest part is that how do you not tell the American Indian tragedy if you committed genocide over here? Mm-hmm. And how do you not share what truth is? But at the same time, as I've also said that no one's trying to tell the opera experience, they need to convert Italian, whatever language is for, for the performance, they need to change it over to English only. People learn how to speak the languages because I think the beauty is when they hear the conversations in other languages and they hear the songs, they want to know. They don't see the song as a song. They see the symphony at the bottom playing. Mm-hmm. They hear the notes. They hear the, you know, the... um melody going up and down they hear the pitches if you're a voice coach you know where they're hitting at yeah. if you're at the song you know you're and if you if that's your language and you're hearing song you want to make sure that it's authentic too so even the people that are singing the songs on the stage has to do it the right way because yep. even if they're not that ethnicity they have to perceive that perception to make sure that that was them, that was the way it was back then, mm-hmm. and that's how you would see a hundred years ago, probably, of that performance. But at the same time is that you're being compared because the people that see operas aren't going to Dallas only. They're going to New York, Los Angeles. They're going everywhere else. And they, they're they comparing that individual to everybody else, they probably love that mm-hmm. show so much. They're traveling everywhere. Yeah, they do that. <laughs> and that's yeah. where I heard him in so and so. Well, I heard him over. It's it's real. And this is my fifteenth ring cycle. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing: it's 
we we take diction courses and are encouraged to take language courses yeah. for this reason. So that people because can love it enough to see it everywhere. And the genre and everything. I mean, we sit in music history classes at 8 o'clock in the morning on Tuesdays and Thursdays trying to learn everything that we can learn and bring it together in a degree. But it all culminates when that person steps out on that stage and starts singing a Lucia di Lamamor and it's in Italian, mm-hmm. you better get the diction right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, you 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 because the thing is is it, it shows that you have studied. Now, I'm not saying you're gonna get every single thing right. We're all human, but you have made an attempt to get it right and you've had the coach beat it into you, your voice teacher has beat it into you, everybody has beat it into you, you know, the conductor. Everybody has, but that that is the exact point right there, is that you're you make sure that you're competent uh-huh. in the language, singing uh-huh. this language before you step out on stage and thinking it, thinking it. And you go to classes and you have coaches and you have all of these things prepare you for that. Yeah. So yeah, one hundred percent, absolutely. And, and that's all the hard the work. That, that's all the work that you see simultaneously that's fluid and because it's organic and every piece relies on each other, guess what? You're just enjoying everything. You're not mm-hmm. technical. You're just enjoying the experience. But I think that's the beauty. But same time is that if you didn't have a culture, what language would it be in? If if the country didn't exist, what would it what would its historical lens be? Mm-hmm. And if it was torn down just to be under, like if it's a school district of edu- of cultural education, how would it be moderated? And mm. I think that's the beauty of y'all being an open source, but at the same time, y'all get to create what was back then and not change the narrative. And I mm. think that's the beauty of people seeing historical cultural value in opera experience, but at the same time is that that's what we do on our platform, our, you know, our um, visual stages too, because everything we're doing is the same way that you see in opera. Mm-hmm. When they when someone asks what is it what is the difference, I challenge them like, well, how bad is the similarities? Because if I'm telling a story, you're telling a story of tragedy. Guess what? They're the same thing. If you're doing all the elements, practice staging, everything else of authenticity, we're doing the same thing of mm-hmm. authenticity. Mm-hmm. And if we're trying to tell a story, you're trying to tell a story of education. Then why why are you saying what's different anymore? Right, right. Yeah. I think, I well, think and it, I think you have to boil it down just like that. The same rehearsal process, all that kind of stuff that that you do, in particularly in preparing for a weekend like you have coming up, it that's exactly what it is. We we prep, we learn the the, the culture, the language, all of those things. Uh, we try to learn the movement, all all the things. It all ties together. And the bottom line is, we're trying to tell the story of a human condition condition human experience right right but there's the common ground (laughs) and in a space like you said um brian it's so fluid and everything has to work together and you get to the point where you're just enjoying it in a space where opera and we've said this before opera is the plural of opus which means many works in a space where we are putting many works together and we are telling stories in such a space, there is room for more stories. There is room for different yes. stories. There is room to tell stories as authentically and as respectfully uh, as possible. Shout out to Asian Opera Alliance. Um, as possible, but then to tell them as human-centered as possible. So we can't say that, oh, we can't tell these particular stories or these particular stories won't ring true for the opera audience when in fact those are the very stories that has created the opera audience that we have now. And as we continue to expand and challenge opera's kind of fascination with tragedy, (laughs) to expand it to be able to tell the full breadth of human experience, including tragedy, right? Including tragedy, including joy, including comedy and all these spaces um, on this the opera stage, no matter how grand, no matter digital, the opera stage and where it is, there is no excuse is what I'm hearing. There's never been an excuse, but now we're in the space of truth telling and greater understanding and awareness. We now see that there is no excuse it is just a matter of how we will shift as a field, how we will shift as organizations to show up in meaningful ways, to tell stories in meaningful ways, to consider 
whether or not um, the things that we are presenting on stage, because in any way, and we've had this conversation, Brian, anything that we show on stage is reiterating something. Yeah. Yep. We're sending a message somehow, some way. And in a lot of cases, it's a message that ties to some type of culture. Uh, historically, it's been European culture. But as we are telling different stories, and as we continue to tell different stories, it ties to something. What message are we sending, and what are we telling people? And I think that's our well, part is that difference is is actually the reverse of similarities, that there's so much, you just don't know how to process it. I think the other hardest part is that even though you're on the stage, you never ask somebody why they're crying after the performance. Mm -hmm. Are they crying because they love it? Are they crying because they know the history? Are they crying because their family has been through that? And ah. I think it's the emotional factor, but same time is that you never ask anybody, why are you crying? You just know that in the moment, that's the emotional feeling that they have. Mm -hmm. At the same time is that why should you ask what's the difference of American Indians and the operatic experience when you know history tells you this? Yeah. But at the same time is that you shouldn't be asking by why they're crying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love it. I just I don't know. I don't know if I have positive notes. <laughs> no, I think that I think that they've been covered because yeah. bottom line is we've heard several things here today. Uh, Elder Peggy talked about when we said, what, what do you need? She said, I need space. We need space. We need a stable space to be able to come together. And the respect, yeah. right, in honoring respect. the voices of those with the lived experience. You no know, yeah. just to people with credentials, but those credentials come because you've studied. You have to have something to study. And those are yeah. people's experiences, right? As we, as we come back, the worship of the written word, we have to make yeah. sure that we're honoring people's experiences and prioritizing the voices of those who live it. Yeah. Um, and then the, 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 just the, 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 the continuous march they've had, they, they've been at this for, well, long before 10 years, but the actual organization itself, you know, the triumph of having the, the last uh, weekend in September, uh, um, to be able to, to sort of culminate in all the work that, that they've been doing. This is a big deal. People have been going at this for years, right? So it's a huge accomplishment. Tying it to uh, the, the event, to every age level, every cultural at, at aspect, people of all different backgrounds are welcome to come. But the fact that you're thinking of ways to make sure that the young children come in and learn the tradition and luring them with candy, that's a smart move, actually. Um, but I think about how we get opera to kids. You know, kids will, kids will, oh, no, I don't know about, but they turn out to be some of the most open audiences that we have a lot of time. But if we don't get it right and we do not meet them at that level, they will let you know. Mm -hmm. I think that's vitally important that we are talking to our young people, no matter, you know, five and six years old, younger than that. It's very, very important. That goes across our, our um, organizations as well, what we're trying to do. Um, I've, I thoroughly enjoyed my time. I have nothing left to say. I've, this, is, this has been great. <laughs> so you've got the, the we're, we're going to, we, we will have you back again um, a couple of days before uh, the powwow starts. Um, but as far as ways that people can show support to your organization right now, um, as it relates not only to, to the organization, but this event, what can people do? I'll give that one to you, uh, Elder Peggy. What can we What can we do to make sure people support not only the organization uh, but the event itself? I, as I just briefly mentioned, the uh, first part of my conversation is that we had a couple, couple of major uh, sponsor potential sponsors that didn't materialize. Mm -hmm. And so we're having a hard time meeting our budget. So any kind of donation would be helpful that make sure that we're, because we want to pay our staff people that's going to be put on the program for us. We got to provide rooms for them because most of them is coming from Oklahoma. And then we got to provide uh some, some supplies and equipments, mm -hmm. some that we've been told that we'll get in kind, but then there's others we still got to purchase. So uh, even though we're not meeting our budget, that's still a lot that we need to be looking at to work, uh, to beg for now, we're getting to that point. Uh, 
the other thing is that we're thinking about is that since it's been raining so much, this is at the bottom of the river, as much as we hate to leave that location because of the name of the Pawa and the reason why we were there, uh -huh. we're going to have to look for a drier place, whether it's indoor or outdoor, somewhere else. And uh, that may uh, hopefully don't increase more costs because we can't, just can't afford it anymore. Uh, and hopefully that, you know, we have some people that would want to underwrite some of our expenses. That would be most grateful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The main thing is that we're a nonprofit organization. So any doc, uh, docu documentation, uh, donations that's made will be tax deductible. Yes, yes. And so for this, uh, we are sharing all of the information, all of the websites and all of the social handles. Uh, you can see some of the amazing work that's happening. So show up, show up in real time and show up in real time in a way, as Brian said, in a way that is going to support for generations to come. And so we've had a beautiful, a very rich um, conversation with the Larnies, first of two that we'll have this month in celebration, in support, and in community with the amazing work that they are doing. If nothing else, take from this for positive notes, the fact that this is what community looks like. It looks like having real conversations. It looks like learning. It looks like expanding yourself, uh, your identity. It looks like deepening your own understanding of your history where you are from, so that when you meet others who are doing the same, it is a mutual space of respect and of co-creation. In opera, we do so much to create. It is important that we co-create with our communities and that we show up in meaningful ways. So thank you, Elder Peggy. Thank you, Brian, for being in community, for your work that you continue to do and that you're committed to doing. Uh, thank you for showing up every time and for agreeing to be guests for taking the stage with Christian and Quo again. We're super excited to have another conversation with you. And then we're excited, of course, for the powwow and the celebration that is coming up. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Christian for our call to action and we'll be done. So our call to action, uh, it really is show up. Uh, you heard them say what they needed. Uh, you heard them say uh, how you can give and how you can help. We'll make sure that you get all that information in the, the, the description. Uh, they'll be back with us in a couple of weeks, uh, closer to the date of the powwow. So there will be even more time for you to continue uh, to support this organization. But don't just support them for the powwow. Continue to support them yes. throughout the year. Other than that, I have nothing left to say. I, I've enjoyed myself thoroughly once again having you all on. It's always a pleasure to get to talk with you and share space with you. And um, I would say moving forward, folks, let's continue to be bold, be create, creative, be courageous. Uh, and let's, let's make sure that we try to walk uh, lockstep with each other and celebrating uh, our differences, but also finding common ground. Thank you for all for tuning in, and we will see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you.